so just quickly, you know, Denver, uh, Denver Urban Gardens uh, is an organization. So we're, we're hosting this, or this event. We're an organization that's been around for about 35 years. Uh, we are the largest independent community garden organization in the country with 190 community gardens across six counties in Metro Denver. Um, and I can't hear anybody at this point. Oh, um, Linda, can you unmute? Sorry about that. Oh, there you okay. go. Have you been hearing me up till now? Yep, it just went off okay. for a second. Got it, okay. Um, we also uh, welcome uh, the Kent Denver community. Um, this actually sort of came about, we're doing a series of, uh, of parents um, sort of education and engagement um, activities and decided to roll that in with our movie chat. So uh, Mary's gonna tell us a little bit about Kent and what's happening there. Um, and yeah, and again, this is just, the purpose of this is just to, to keep this conversation going um, around farming, clean food, intentional sourcing. Uh, so please uh, enjoy and pass it on. Um, and the movie, I don't know how many, you know, watching the movie is not mandatory, but for those of you who have seen it, you know, it's a really, it's a sweet movie about, uh, you know, a couple who starts an or a regenerative farm from scratch um, and literally transforms the land uh, and the entire ecosystem and bringing it back to life and serving as a model for, you know, for ways that both farmers and uh, agriculture can emulate. But also what we want to do here is give everybody tools to take these learnings into their homes uh, and make impact every single day. So um, I'm going to tell you guys about our amazing panelists, first of all, and then talk through the agenda. So with us, we have uh, Mary Calkins. Uh, and Mary is a parent of a sophomore at Kent Denver. Along with her husband, Carl, they're parent liaisons for the tiny farm. Uh, Mary grew up in Denver eating TV dinners when not force-fed asparagus from the backyard patch. She and her family, together with another family, had been growing a garden, tending chickens, goats, pigs, and hosting woofers in Maine in the summers for over a decade. She brought raspberries, strawberries, gooseberries, and a few herbs and a bench to the tiny farm from her childhood home, backyard, along with hopes to inspire a next generation to get outside. So thanks for joining us, Mary. We look forward to hearing about what's happening at the tiny farm. Uh, next, we have Molly Englehart all the way with us from Southern California. So Molly is an executive chef and owner of Sage Plant-Based Bistro, a growing group of plant-based organic comfort food restaurants in the greater LA area. She operates a 17-acre organic farm, Sow a Heart, focused on regenerative ag agriculture that doubles as an animal rescue, including an aviary for rescued parrots. Molly is also a board member of Kiss the Ground and executive producer of the award-winning documentary film, May I Be Frank. Thank you, Molly. Rucker, so we have Rucker Myers. He's the soil health technician at Denver Botanic Gardens at Chatfield Farms. He's currently building a compost program for Chatfield Farms 325 acre site using the training and knowledge acquired from Denver Urban Gardens Master Composter Program run by Judy Elliott, our other uh, illustrious panelist. Um, before moving to Colorado, Rutger implemented a compost program at Vista Gardens, a community garden in Tampa, Florida, that has since grown produce uh, two tons of compost per year by hand. He believes that soil science can help our planet in ways we cannot yet quantify. A healthy planet needs healthy soil. And then last but certainly not least, we have Judy, aka Jungle Judy, aka Judy Elliott. Uh, she's been with Doug for over 20 years and has a background in social work and horticulture. She's passionate about involving young youth and adults in utilizing garden-based education as a way of becoming deeply rooted in their communities and learning fun ways to actually eat the produce they grow. She's about all things of the earth and spends any free time with her grandkids who meet her with a garden trowel to dig worms, Great Pyrenees dog, Maine Coon Cat, and extensive veggie and perennial beds and indoor tropical sunroom. So thank you, uh, Judy, for joining us as well. So that's, uh, that's the crowd. And the way that this is gonna work is that we're gonna go, each, each um, panelist is going to talk about a topic. Um, and then we're gonna save our questions till the end, but please do post them in the chat. And uh, Nico will help us sort of pull them together and then we'll open up the floor at the end of the, um, panel. 
So first we're gonna hear from Mary, who's gonna talk about the tiny farm. Uh, then the whole group is gonna have a quick chat about what is regenerative. Uh, so we're gonna have a quick lightning round around that. Then we're gonna hear from Molly, who's gonna talk about regenerative farming on a producing farm. Rucker is gonna talk to us about regenerative farming on a community-based farm. And then Mayor, uh, and then Judy, sorry, is going to talk about regenerative gardening uh, and gardening with kids. So with that, I turn the floor to Mary to tell us about the tiny farm at Kent and anything else she wishes to share. Thanks, Linda. Did that work? I unmuted. Um, I'm Mary Calkins. I'm a Kent Denver parent. And my husband, Carl, and I have been trying to help connect the parent community in supporting the tiny farm. Uh, the tiny farm was envisioned by Lily Newcomb, a teacher at Kent, and as part of the summer program for kids. And it's now blossomed into lots of school programs from art to engineering, alternative energy, a student club, a variety of volunteer opportunities. Maybe that's why you're here. Uh, social events and, and these events, these online opportunities, in addition to its original summer camp um, vision that started it all. The tiny farm sits on the western edge of campus. It's behind the baseball field if you haven't visited. And it's the ancestral home and unceded lands of the Ute and Cheyenne. We are so grateful to Linda Appel Lipsius and everyone at Denver Urban Gardens for organizing this evening, this panel discussion about the biggest little farm around the importance of soil health and the interconnectedness of all of the elements that contribute to the health of the farm. It's a dynamic, beautiful and complex topic. And since we recognize that we are indeed participants, we are here to figure out how to best fit in. Thank you so much for making this happen. And thank you everyone for tuning in and um, being here tonight. We're really glad to have you and hope you continue to join us on any tiny farm activities. You're always welcome. Thanks. And now, let's see, I guess I hand it to, I'm not sure. The group. <laughs> the yeah, awesome. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, for those of you who, who are Denver based, definitely, yeah, if you can go visit the farm, uh, the tiny farm at Kent Denver, it's pretty adorable. And there's some really great programming going on. I think composting is going in this summer. Really excited to see that. Um, okay, so now we're going to just have a conversation about what regenerative is. Um, so again, we're, you know, there's probably a broad range of sort of knowledge uh, in the room um, as far as what what this what this means. So I would love to start with Molly, um, just on kind of 101, you know, what's defining elements of regenerative farming, um, and also acknowledging, you know, the roots of regenerative practices, you know, it's become something that is working its way into, you know, sort of common parlance these days. But, uh, you know, these are practices, <clears throat> these are the practices that have been around forever. Uh, and I feel like there's sort of an interesting rediscovery of them. But you know, would love to chat about the origins um, of these regenerative practices. So Molly, if you want to kick us off. Well, oh, and you are on mute. Regenerative farming is essentially when you are observing nature and then using those things you see in nature in a controlled environment for producing food or for producing um, something. And it's when you're giving more to the soil, to the earth, to the whole, than you're taking out. And these practices are rooted in many native cultures when people were still in the remembrance of that they were part of the whole and not thinking they were separate and outside of the whole. And I'm glad that these conversations are coming back to the forefront. And I'm sad that we lost so many of these conversations uh, for so many years. But the main practices of regenerative farming are holistic planned grazing. So that's when you recreate like what the buffalo were doing, where you have them eat in one area for a short period of time, pee, poop, pee, poop, stomp down the grass and move on, but don't eat everything. They only take about 50%. They leave all their waste as 
um, fertilizer and the other grasses that are stomped down. And that does a lot for the seed bed for the top eight inches of topsoil. And, and can we can really reverse desertification by modeling what the buffalo once did, but human beings took the buffalo irresponsibly out of the ecosystem and made a lot of damage. Um, so holistic planned grazing and ruminant animals is one way. Another way is permaculture, where we have um, plants that are staying in the ground and constantly feeding the soil and the microbes and not so many annuals and the annuals are planted in between those um, and using compost and building soil over the time and always being mindful of the giving more than you take is kind of the foundation and the fundamentals of regenerative agriculture and remembering that we're part of the whole that is nature. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Rucker, you wanna, you wanna continue the conversation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think being a part of your environment and contributing to your environment. Um, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I couldn't have said any of that better myself. Um, I think right now we're at the stage with regenerative farming where Oh, we got connection. <laughs> All right, we'll give it another couple seconds and then Judy, if you wanna hop on until we get it back. All right, Judy, you wanna join us? Oh. Junior, uh, unmute. There you go. Uh, All right. So, if we're talking about the difference, many of us are aware of organic gardening or organic farming, and then we're talking regenerative farming or regenerative agriculture. So, organic farming is really a, a system of growing that is mindful of the soil, mindful of the earth, uses many of the same principles as regenerative farming, but is really a prescriptive, if you will, it's a practice based. Um, a process that has different things that you put on or you don't put on. It adheres to non-using, it does not use or adhere to synthetic chemicals or fertilizers. It uses mulches, it uses cover crops, but it really is for food production. So it is a prescriptive thing with standards that are very much developed by the Organic Farming Farmer Producers Association with really not that much emphasis on the end result health of the land, although it does use compost. Regenerative techniques of growing use the same practices of compost, cover crops, crop rotation, um, but it goes one step further. And it looks at, I'm looking to um, increase that health of the soil, not just turn it from clod into something that I can grow with, but increase the biodiversity of the whole land, increase the um, ecological balance, not only above, but below ground, but basically put everything in balance so that it deals with increasing the networks of fungal, fungal mycelium below the soil and lets people know that the important thing are the outcomes, the long-term outcomes of soil health to increase the health of the planet. So I think it goes one step further than organic farming in that it looks at the real balanced in um, ecosystem and looks for that um, outcome of, of increased soil health. Awesome. Thank you, Judy. Hey, Rucker. <laughs> Thanks for joining us again. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Do you okay. want to you want to continue? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was just saying, um, you know, I, I've, I've heard some people say that the um, the term regenerative farming has become so broad that we need to start setting definitions. And I'm very interested in that, um, particularly in the way that we treat our soil. Um, I, you know, not tilling, number one, uh, cover cropping, number two. Um, my, my worry is that, you know, for example, organic farming, um, you can not be organic and have great practices or you can be an organic farm certified organic and you can over fertilize and that you know you can contribute to pollution of our waterways so i think that um 
or regenerative farming needs to be defined by how we treat our soil. Um, and the big two, uh, not tilling, cover cropping, um, always keeping a, a live ground cover for our soil. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I think the thing too, you know, the real big takeaway from, I think the film um, that it really showed was biodiversity, uh, you know, and just really embracing biodiversity and um, the role that, you know, sort of a, a diverse, maybe, you know, I, I feel like the, this, this sort of tendency in conventional agriculture, or what we expect from our gardens or that they're perfectly manicured and everything is, you know, sort of sterile and clean rows and every, you know, and, and I think there's really uh, an opportunity to embrace um, diversity and, you know, what shows up and how does it interact and a lot of observation as well. Um, acknowledging that, you know, there's a whole ecosystem um, that, that with conventional and, uh, you know, chemical farming, I think we have managed to, um, you know, put a lot of that down. So really embracing diversity and maybe a little bit of chaos. <laughs> so um, cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for that. Um, so now we're just going to go and hear, hear some other stories. Um, you know, so we, there's the movie and we saw, you know, the experience with, with building that great farm and we're really excited to have Molly here, who I think is, you know, she's built her own, um, awesome farm. And as a chef is definitely incorporating, uh, the work that she does and the food that she grows. And I think what I find really exciting about somebody who's, who's in the food service world and as a producer as well, is you get actually get the consumer interaction. You have an opportunity to go face to face and educate with your customers and your guests, you know, every single day about the work that you're doing. So, uh, so please over to you to hear about uh, what you do every day. Um, yeah, I am a chef and I own a restaurant and I would go out to the floor um, of the restaurant and anybody that I thought had enough money to buy a farm, I'd try to convince them that they need to do regenerative agriculture and we could sequester carbon. And I was so inspired by the idea that there was something we could do because prior to discovering regenerative agriculture, I felt a little apathetic about the environment and about who we were as humans on the planet. So I would go out to the floor and everybody would be like, there'd be a coach for the Clippers in the restaurant and I'd go run and tell, try to tell them to buy a farm. And there'd be some celebrity and I'd try to convince them to buy a farm. And one day I just realized like, I'm the one that I've been waiting for. And so me and my husband started our journey of trying to get a farm and he was undocumented when we got married. And it was very, very hard for us to get any land, get any loan from a bank. And so uh, finally we were able to um, get a loan. And finally we were able to start our farm about four years ago. And the first step was to just start bringing all the waste from the restaurant and turning that into soil and closing that food loop. So all the food going to my restaurant is being fed by the food that's coming out of my restaurant, keeping it all in the loop. And so that is the first thing that I was doing. And then the next thing I was doing, how do I change the picture? Oh, you're okay, there's my farm. Um, so the next thing that I was doing uh, was, okay, what else can I produce for my restaurants? And so I started experimenting and we, um, we put in avocado trees and orange tree, like all the citrus. And then we did row crops in between. And this has been really powerful for us because that we never are doing more than 17 feet of row crops. So there's never more than 17 feet of fallow land. So there's never like where we're just killing everything in a whole field. And then there's always these strips of permanent plant matter um, between anywhere that we're growing the vegetables for um, the restaurant. And so we really had an awesome experience of being able to sell whatever we make. I have the opportunity like, oh my God, we overdid eggplant. We didn't know what we were doing. Nobody needs 4,000 eggplant plants, but okay, it's eggplant everything in the restaurants for the next seven weeks. And so that has really been um, a blessing. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we started our um, farm boxes. And one thing um, as far as calls to action and what people can do here um, is if you can buy not good looking produce, if you can encourage farmers that it's okay, I mean, this is a really big thing. Like we throw away so much produce and I don't mean me, we as Soul Heart Farm, but I mean 
as a society, we throw away so much produce because it's not perfect. One of the most powerful things that we can do is as consumers empower the farmers around us that it's okay if things look a little bit not perfect. How do I go to the next slide? Oh, okay. Someone else is to draw. So these are some of the practices. Uh, we have a huge uh, 70 foot vermicol uh, vermicompost bin on our farm. And so this is one of the ways that we transform the food waste on our farm into um, soil. Um, and so this is one really excellent way um, that we're able to close that food loop. And the second photograph here that you can see, this is natural pest control. So we use our oranges to draw bugs away from the sensitive things in our greenhouse, um, specifically roly polies in the wintertime move into our greenhouse because it's warm and they start to eat everything because there's not enough organic matter around for them to do um, to eat because it's the wintertime and they're, they all run in there. And so if you can see in that picture, we put thousands of oranges, half of oranges cut in half between all the lettuce and the, all the roly polies run to the oranges. So this is a way we're using something that's a byproduct of orange juice we make for the restaurant. And now we're using that to build more soil and keep the roly polies off of the butter lettuce. So that's a um, really interesting way that we are able to use um, something that's a waste product as a pest control and to build more fertile, uh, more fertile soil. So um, that is another thing. And then we started our CSA program at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we have 200 people a week that get a box delivered from our farm. And um, a lot of people ask me, you're a vegan chef and why do you have animals on your farm? And we are really in partnership with the animals on our farm. Um, I had an idea of who I was gonna be as a vegan chef, as a farmer. And I didn't think I would have a lot of animals. Um, but honestly, we use sheep to mow between the rows. We use goats to clean up areas and we use our cows to poop and they make this amazing compost that we mix with the food waste from the restaurant. And so we really feel that we're in partnership with the animals and that this is how nature works. Um, we are not outside. And so as of 40 years of being a vegan, I had this idea um, that to be separate, the animals should not be in agriculture. And I've actually shifted that. I think that abuse should not be in agriculture, but I do think that animals play a really profound role in carbon sequestration. And I think that we should always um, remember that we don't want abuse of anybody in agriculture, humans or, um, and so when we think about cheap food versus organic or regenerative food, we do have to remember that to produce that cheap food, there was likely abuse along the way. If it's human beings getting sick from the chemicals that they're um, touching, or if it's animals being in conditions that they shouldn't be. And so we do have to remember that there's a cost that we not are not necessarily associating with um, the price, like, oh, it seems good. That's a good price for that. But there is another cost that is greater and bigger um, than just how many dollars this thing costs. Um, and so all of that is to say that we are on a journey and I'm learning every day. And this is just four years into our regenerative journey, but our soil is incredible. We took basically a rock, a rock bottom you know, used to be sprayed with Roundup and glyphosate every so very often and turned it into something that um, our soil is beautiful. It has so much microbiology and so much worms and so much nematodes um, year over year. And we don't dig, uh, we do no dig, we do no till, we do cover crops, we integrate animals, all of that to try to be the best cell that we can be in the whole body of the earth. And that's about, did I have another slide? That was my end slide. That was all my, that was it. Um, I, that's about all. Um, and if you guys are interested more, you can visit our website. Um, but thank you so much for having me and talking about my favorite thing, soil. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, it looks absolutely beautiful.
Um, and I think one thing that I that I'm always struck by is, you know, Molly, you're talking about how you take the food that you produce in the restaurant and it goes, you know, that you get from the farm and then you send it back to the farm. And I think that's the idea that, you know, we, we need to move towards is, you know, this closed loop ecosystem is that, you know, there is no such thing. Uh, well, there is such thing as waste, but organic waste and compost, uh, you know, we don't just throw it behind us and never look back you know, it's actually, it, it goes back in and it, it just recreates the cycle and starting to really appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity and power of composting, which we're going to hear about in spades from our next two speakers, um, you know, is something that I, it's just a different mindset is really, you know, how do we thoughtfully use the waste that we produce to then rebuild the next cycle? So mm -hmm. thank you. Oh, go ahead. The other thing is we have a brewery. So we also use all the grain yeah. from our brewery for all of our livestock which then also feeds into our compost, but the grain by itself would be too much protein to put into the, it wouldn't be great for the compost by itself, but through the animals um, intestines, it's like a whole nother um, way that we use our waste to make soil. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then I also did put into the chat, a link to um, a Ted talk by Alan Sabry. Uh, you know, Molly's talking about integrating livestock into farms and, you know, how important it is that, you know, you, you, it's all part of the natural system. And, uh, you know, even, even if you're, you have a, you know, a vegan approach, uh, you know, animals, they're part of it and we need to embrace and we need to be sure to integrate, uh, you know, sensibly, um, to ensure that the, the farm thrives and the, the ecosystem thrives. So, Thank you for that. Um, and again, please feel free to put your questions as they come up. They can be about the movie. They can be about regenerative ag. They can be about, you know, growing carrots in your backyard. <laughs> you know, whatever you guys feel like, uh, feel like chatting about. Um, so with that, I'm going to move from Molly, who's in beautiful lush Southern California, to Rutger, who gets to farm in Colorado, uh, you know, who is now under, uh, you know, deep freeze. We have a six month growing season. Whenever we travel to California or Hawaii, it's cruel and unusual punishment because we don't, we have such a gro short growing season. Uh, but Rutger, please tell us, uh, you know, how you guys do what you do. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Um, are we seeing this? Are we good? Yeah. All right. Um, my name is Rutger Myers. I am the soil health technician at Chapman Farms um, in Littleton, Colorado. Um, and I'm going to tell you how I became um, interested in this field. Um, I changed careers when I was 30. Um, and just a couple years, I'm just a baby soil scientist here. So um, we are a seven acre veggie production. We have a 350 person CSA. Um, and we also do a significant donation um, shared to various organizations. Um, one thing that's unique about our site is um, we are a botanic garden. So we are owned by Denver Botanic um, and we are part of a 325 acre site. Um, so around us, right next to us, there's a conventionally grown cornfield and pumpkin patch, um, and we're constantly at odds with that. So we are organic practices, but we probably will never be certified organic. But on the bright side, we are surrounded by botanic gardens, and it is gorgeous. So I got into farming um, in 2019, and I just fell in love with the culture. Um, the people that I've met while farming We'll be friends for life and every single year with a new crew I meet new people that I will always connect with. Uh, it's really a special culture. Um, also I built a connection with my food that I didn't realize I, I could have. I, I've ate vegetables my entire life and I learned about new vegetables. I learned what they look like in the ground um, and I learned what it was like to grow my own food which is a special feeling. And just like you see in the movie um, a healthy farm is a healthy ecosystem. So we're constantly taking pictures of critters and eggs and reptiles. And my camera roll is just full of things that, that I haven't seen that I want to show someone else. Um, you know, it just never gets old and I'm always curious. Um, so basically, as soon as I started working at Chatfield, I was, a, I was a volunteer and I just thought, how can I make my way into this field? Um, and I saw their compost piles and I said, hey, I, I can probably fix this. <laughs> I, you know, I had a little bit of experience. I grew up in, in Florida in the suburbs, uh, but we always had an active compost pile. Um, we were always managing compost. So I thought I'd give my 
you know, this is probably my best bet to get a full-time job here. So I enrolled in the Denver Master Composter Program uh, with uh, Denver Urban Gardens. Um, on, the, on your right, you'll hear, this is Judy. You'll hear from her next. She, um, she's my compost mentor. And again, the common theme is the people are just amazing. Um, she's friends for life everywhere. Um, so in 2020, I was given uh, a little bit of land at the farm to try my hand at composting. So I did what I knew. Uh, I made a backyard style pile. I started turning it with a pitchfork early in the morning. I would show up before work. Um, and one pile eventually turned into six. I experimented with various different feedstocks for the piles, things that I put into the piles. Um, and I, I monitored the temperature and I reported back. Um, really, I just wanted to prove that I could make compost. Um, and this is towards the end of the process. Um, at the end of the year, my seasonal job was running out and I, I decided, you know, I wanna come back next year. So I stayed on, I collected all this, all the organic matter I could find from, from the soil surface and I put it into this pile. Um, I made this pile by hand again with a pitchfork. Um, and I just really absolutely thought that we should be composting um, everything that we waste there. So there should be no waste. Um, if you've ever worked in a seasonal job, um, you know it's hard leaving. This is me tucking my compost uh, to bed for the off season. Um, thankfully, uh, in 2021, the director of our site called me in his office and he put me in charge of managing the entire 325 acre site uh, of compost. So <laughs> my biggest dream up to that point was the seven acres of veggies. And, and at this point I was like, well, I guess I need to learn how to drive a tractor. Um, so this is me setting up my site um, we had the farm crew helping turn piles with pitchforks. It was just crazy at the time. And eventually I, I developed this method of turning um, compost with essentially a forklift. Uh, this is called a skid steer. Um, and I, I got pretty good using that machine too. Um, and it eventually became a one-man operation. Um, this is a, a, a very successful pile. Um, and this is what my site generally looks like today. Um, we're producing about 40, 40 tons of compost a year um, and is just gonna increase with uh, years to come. Um, my, you know, yes, I do want to continue to produce more compost at Chatfield, but I also want to become a display for small scale farmers. So this is our veterans program. These are bioreactors. Um, it's really a low cost, um, no turn option that I think a lot of farmers should look into. Um, and I just, eventually I just wanna have a bunch of different ways that you can compost on our site display because we get a lot of farms visiting our site. Um, and I think it's important to exchange ideas. Um, every year I have farmed in Colorado, we have been hit by a major weather event in early September. Um, and this year really hit us pretty hard. This was a, um, you know, we got four inches of hail and it just wiped out pretty much everything we were growing. Um, you, you talk about persistence. Um, we had compost, so at least we could put what we didn't grow back into our soil for the next year, and I was very proud of that. Um, but these weather events, they, they changed the way that I think about farming. Um, yes, I still have fun, and yes, I, you know, I love the people I farm with, but now I think more about my niece, and I think about the world that she's going to inherit, and um, I think about the experiences that I can pass on to her. Um, there's nothing more beautiful than a little kid at the farm. And I think that we should all recognize that. Mm. So at Chatfield, we are, um, we're faced with some unique challenges. We do have animals, but we cannot use them. <laughs> they're, um, they're essentially there for show. Um, Maybe someday we will get access to them, um, but for now we are challenged with a entirely veggie based process, um, which is something that if there's someone that's gonna do it, I think we can do it, but um, I always have my eye on these goats <laughs> because they sure could help us out with the weeds. Uh, cover cropping, um, this last year, 2021, we really got into cover cropping. This is Triticale. Um, and essentially what this is doing is providing a, a live land, uh, live ground cover. We're um, crimping here and um, 
right before the hail, we, we planted some beans that were really doing pretty well. Um, so it's not easy, um, but we're starting the process. Um, this is where I'll get just a little sciencey, but I think it's important. Um, this is the carbon cycle. So when we talk about carbon sequestration, putting carbon into the soil, um, this is it. Um, I think in today's um, climate crisis, there's a lot of talk about um, emission reduction, what you can do to reduce your, your footprint. But what carbon sequestration is, is taking the carbon from our atmosphere and putting it back into the soil and balancing that out. And I, I find a lot of encouragement knowing that there's something we can do to reverse this process. This is something we need to do. Um, we can't just reduce emissions. We need to put the carbon back into our soil. So how do we measure this? Um, this year, uh, I was given the job soil health technician and I got access to a microscope, which is just as exciting as the tractor. Uh, this is a, a special job where you can look at a microscope in the morning and then drive a tractor in the afternoon. So we're, we're looking at fungi and bacteria, organic matter. We're trying to find glomulin, which is, holds the soil structure together through uh, the microorganisms. Um, and really we're just getting started here, but it's very exciting. We're also putting together a field test. These are affordable tests, um, mostly things that you can find around your kitchen and they're testing the structure, the stability of your soil. And it's really, it's physical attributes, but what you're testing for is the biology within the soil. So you're testing for the, the byproducts of the microorganisms in our soil. And um, you know, most importantly, we need this to be cheap um, and um, something that small farmers want to do. I think soil tests are mineral tests. I think they're helpful every couple of years, but they're not the Bible. I think that there's something that we should look at as an indication, but it's the life in our soil that we need to focus on. So you take, for example, in Biggest Little Farm, there was a flood and the healthy soil could absorb the water and the unhealthy soil, it just ran right off. That's what we're testing. We're testing water infiltration, how fast it can absorb water, our soil can absorb water, and how much water it can absorb. And hopefully we'll see some differences as we change our practices. This year, probably the most exciting news of the year, um, I, I learned how to write a grant. Um, I, through the Master Composter Program, I was told about a grant opportunity and I, I wrote a grant and we got funding for our compost program. We got $100,000. So we are gonna be using our own material, our own machinery. Uh, it's, it's really gonna change things. But I included in this grant an educational worm bin, a compost tea brewer, backyard style compost in the front facing areas where visitors walk by because I wanna teach small farmers and visitors how to compost. I think that can make a huge difference. And we're also sharing machinery with small farms. Um, we're gonna get a, a chipper shredder and we're gonna, we're gonna chip up and shred up uh, small scale farmers compost and hopefully give the entire compost community a boost. So like I said, the, the goal is to elevate the community. Um, this type of soil science I think is a young field and we need to collaborate and we need to share ideas, share what works. Uh, this is me at Frontline Farming. They're a wonderful organization uh, with another mentor of mine. He's teaching me about compost. Um, <laughs> fun fact, a healthy soil has bacteria that triggers serotonin production. So <laughs> maybe I'm just high on soil, but I am excited to work on this field, uh, in this field for a very long time. Um, yes, the past years, three years have been very exciting for us and productive and surreal, um, but I think what we're gonna be doing in the next few years is even more exciting. And please, please feel free to email me with questions. I think we're probably gonna to get to that at the end. I have some resources, but um, thank you so much. Excellent. Awesome, thank you so much, Rutger. Um, you know, just was really excited also for everyone here, for those of you who are from Denver, uh, you know, I mean, the Botanic Gardens is beloved, Chatfield is beloved, and what you're doing, you know, in this, with this demonstration farm and inviting the community in, I mean, everything you guys do is for, for public demonstration, and public education. So the more you're doing around the composting and the regenerative practices uh, is just a gift to the city. So, so thank you for that. And, uh, you know, just can't wait for more people to come out and see your, your big mega compost program. Um, <laughs> congratulations on that. Um, cool.
cool. Okay. And then uh, Judy, I think you're gonna, you're gonna round this out. Yeah, I am. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I'm going to talk to you about how in the world can you involve kids in gardening and regenerative practices? Well, I think, you know, I live my life with children and with a sense of the soil. And I love this quote from a website that I love called Daily On. And it says, when we approach children with the, with the awareness that they can really teach us, we automatically become more present ourselves because they live their lives fully immersed in the present moment, seeing everything with the open-mindedness born of unknowing. So when I garden with children, first of all, I give up a full sense of what a garden should. I give up any shoulds. A garden should be neat pathways. A garden should be neat rows of vegetables growing. You need to be careful that you don't break the crops. What I'm looking at is an immersive experience for children. And when I garden with children or when I work with children, I incorporate a sense of joy, that sense of joy and wonder. And I give up my prescribed ways of doing things. And first of all, I celebrate their diversity and I become a child myself. So the ability to give up your sense of adultness, if you will, to immerse yourself in the messiness, um, to cultivate a, a sense of debris. I think everybody needs to, to cultivate an appreciation for a sense of debris and unplanned moments when you're gardening with children. And then we need to make a connection. We're all looking to live lives in high level wellness. So if you approach children with, hmm, what do you need to be really healthy? And what does a garden need to be really healthy? I've done this with children as young as first grade. Children will know that they need a good home to live in. Well, our garden plants need a good home to live in. And might, what might that incorporate? Well, that might include um, a place that feels really soft. So that feels like you wanna stay, you wanna pause, you just wanna be there. And I love to do an exercise with children that incorporates the idea of space. So in order to do that, I'll put children really close together in a line and I'll force them to stay really close together. And I'll ask them how that feels. And they invariably tell me it doesn't feel really good. And they come up with the word, eh, I need space between me. That lets them know that our plants that we grow also need space between them. And then we talk about what do you need in the way of food to be healthy, to be as healthy as you can. You might wanna eat junk food and candy and sweets all the time, but you probably wouldn't be all that healthy. And you align that to what plants need. They need a good soil to build, to work with. They need a certain sense of water, a certain sense of being cared for, and that overall sense of nurturing. So we make connections between what we need the air, the water, the nurturing, and what plants need to be fully healthy. And you approach gardening with children with that feeling of open, open, you know, you're an open mind. You don't have any prescribed plans. You're really curious. And most importantly, you give up that sense of protection. And I always have questions from teachers or from adults. How can I learn? I'm not a teacher. I've never had any training in garden. gardening. How can I immerse my children in that sense of wonder and, and joy for the earth. Children aren't asking you to be an expert. They're just asking you to be in the garden, let them be the kid, and at times, let them be a teacher. So with everything that I do with children, I look at what they're observing, and I look at that experience as an opportunity to provoke wonder and experiential learning. And let me give you some ideas about how to do that. I remember one time when I was doing uh, some gardening education in the summer and I came out at a time in the garden camp when it wasn't an appropriate time. It was a time uh, right with Ramadan when some of my um, uh, people that um, are Muslims had fasted the whole day and it was also 4th of July. So there was a lot of stress going on but I had my prescribed lesson and it happened to be about pollination and about how things grow and about biodiversity. But I was losing the children and their attention was wandering until one of the children asked me to please shut up. And Jungle Duty shut up and I listened. And what he told me was mind opening. 
because he directed my attention to the leaves of some bushes that had some flowers and had some fruit on it. And he said, Miss Judy, while you were so interested in trying to teach us what was happening, I was looking at some of those birds. I have no idea what those birds were, but they were dropping something down on the ground and I'm wondering what it was that they were dropping. And I stopped and I said, I was trying to provide prescribed learning instead of observing and making my learning true to form. What he was describing were some starlings that were plucking choke cherries from the bushes above, dropping the fruit, and in time those seeds were then growing new choke cherries which were overtaking the cracks in the sidewalks. So this became a lesson about, you know, wildlife spreading, encouraging place for habitats, um, allowing things to happen. And he said, you know what I wanna do? He says, let's go and dig up some of these choke cherries that are spreading and transplant them to some other part in the garden. I said, that's what we're doing. Giving up an idea of how we transplant roots. So I became a child. I let the child teach me. And I can guarantee you that those children through that sense of being allowed to observe and become a teacher and direct my knowledge will never forget the lesson of the bird eating the cherry, pooping out the seed and it's spreading. Another thing that I do when I'm engaging children in a garden activity is that every step of that learning is modeled. I don't expect a child to come into the garden with any prescribed sense of, of knowledge. So whether it is planting, whether it is digging a weed, I model it in many different ways for children who learn in many different ways. I engage the senses constantly what can I feel? I encourage people to plant gardens that are not in straight rows, that are sometimes in the shape of clouds or trees or you know, rainbows. I've done rainbow gardens with children with different rainbow colored flowers where we, where we investigate the different pollinators. Um, plants that engage textures, that engage sound, that engage taste. So allow that to happen. Realize that a garden is not all work. If you come with a prescribed task of what you're gonna do, you're gonna lose a child. Just dig. Richard Liu wrote a wonderful book years and years ago, The Last Child in the Woods, where he describes the wonderful um, disability that we have to program all of our children's learning. Those wild spaces that are, that are at the edge of program places of where they, our children learn. So unstructured play areas that are mud areas, that are dirt areas, that allow a children to put a log down, leave a log down for, um, for a season. I remember an experience with one of my grandchildren from Florida and what he loves most of all is coming out and going on wildlife hikes where he's allowed to overturn a log. And what he finds under that log is a whole diverse, biodiverse micro community of sow bugs, millipedes, centipedes, beetles, and then we talk about why that log is decomposing, but allowing children to observe and find things for themselves and incorporate, incorporate into their understanding of that decomposing log is helping that wonderful soil to, to, to come. Those beetles and millipedes are there because we don't spray anything that's going to kill them. They're all part of that connected cycle of life. Um, involving our parents and our grandparents in their wisdom from other cultures. I wanna stop for a moment and mention this activity that I do all the time that's on the screen called a magic spot. And it's something that you can do with any age child because one of the things that gardens do for children when you're engaging that sense of wonder is it also appeals to their need for quiet places and their need for their favorite places that is really their own. So just like that squirrel is stopping and wondering and is amazed you can use colors that appeal to them. You can use tree stumps, you can use quiet places and then have the child observe what makes it so special. What sounds do they hear through the season that change as time goes by? How can they measure that growth? How does that growth feel? How do the colors change through the season? Magic spot is really, really important. Um, I've often been asked, it's really discouraging. I start some things with children and they don't seem to work. You know what? Life doesn't always seem to work. So what we're looking for is the total immersion experience with a child 
not the end result. It's not that important if we ever get a tomato. It is, an import, it is important if a child gets immersed in noticing that underneath that leaf, there might be something that is chewing on an aphid. If he looks at a dill plant, he might see ladybugs and then wondering why on the flowering dill there are ladybugs and then get down further and observe that, oh my goodness, those ladybugs are chewing on these little green and yellow insects that he then learns are, are aphids. So through observation and through immersion in what's happening in a garden, a child really gets a wonderful idea of being a wonderful, wonderful learner. Insects are going to de devour plants. Sometimes that's not the important thing. It's learning about the cycles. It's learning about underneath. I would encourage all of you in your garden settings with children to put decomposing bales of straw. They're one of my wonderful, my, one of my best teaching instruments. Underneath that bale of straw, as it breaks down, you begin to see soil forming. You can feel the spongy soil beneath and how it differs from that bare hard soil. You can have a child lift that bale of straw up, dig down with their hands and say, oh my goodness, I can put my whole arm down underneath because it's so soft and it's so alive. You can have them pour some water down underneath and find that that water infiltrates down. I wanna read you a quote from one of my favorite books called The Thunder Tree. And it says, gardens are places of initiation where the borders between ourselves and other creatures break down, where the earth really gets under our nails and a sense of place gets under our skin. I would encourage you to focus on the small changes in the garden and the child as that season unfolds. And lastly, I would like to just, I know I'm running out of time. I could probably talk for two hours. Obviously, when you're working with children, you're talking biodiversity. You're talking diversity of experiences, diversity of, the, of culture, of things that they come prepared to learn, experiences. But you're also exposing them to the, bio, the biodiversity of flowers, of plants, of insects, of learning experiences in the garden. And when you connect the two and you make that connection that the more that we have different things in the garden, the more our learning experiences are going to be varied and the more our garden is going to thrive. There are lots of activities you can do. Um, there are lots of fun things you can try. In addition to looking under mulch, we talked about a magic spot. I'd encourage you to dig as many roots as you can with children and look not only, not only artistically, but the way roots penetrate soils and mine nutrients. Learn the difference between digging a grass plant early on in the season. Rutger showed a picture of me with some um, accoutrements on my hair at the compost site. Those happen to have been bindweeds, bindweed plants that um, have spread their roots deep into the soil. Show the children the difference between a grass plant that has roots that look like the hair of, their, of your head. Even put those roots on your hair here and let them know that those go just really shallowly in the soil. Have them dig a plant like a dandelion or a mallow with roots that go down deep in the soil and that are survivors that mine everything. So essentially use everything that a child lets you know is there to use. Um, encourage your sense of feeling, of wanting to be in the garden, of making it their own. A couple of books that I recommend, Up and Down in the Garden, Up in the Garden, Down in the Dirt, Introduce you, introduces you to the diverse array of things that are growing above ground and the creatures below soil. I swear by this teaching in nature's classroom that we use in our ECE and, um, and younger uh, children education, it produces a different philosophy, if you will, of gardening of children that really celebrates joy and wonder and uh, allows you to be a kid. And compost stew allows you with very young children to use all the vegetables and fruits, fruits from A to Z as a prescription for healthy soil. So basically that's all I have. I thank you very much for involving yourself with us. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you, Judy, for sharing that. Um, I think uh, just, just, you know, she, Judy focused a lot on the power of gardening and farming and digging in the dirt for, for kids and transforming lives. And, you know, at Doug, um, something that we've done this year is we've, we've expanded our scope 
uh, beyond just K-12 going to start starting to work with kids in ECE. So the, the really littles really acknowledging that uh, behaviors and, and connection to earth and even food preferences really starts so young. I mean, it, it's, you know, as early as you can get these little guys digging in the dirt or playing with the worms, like, like our little tiny composters are doing. But this also extends to, you know, the book, uh, you know, Last Child in the Wood, that's woods that Judy was speaking of, uh, you know, and with our high schoolers and our middle schoolers, you know, getting the kids off of technology and getting them into nature and getting them, you know, connected to uh, the outdoors and just the many, many benefits that come from that. So, so this is really all tied into mental, you know, and physical wellness, uh, community building, uh, you know, nutrition, et cetera. So lots and lots of lessons here. Um, so thank you uh, panelists for sharing with us. Um, and now we are going to open the floor to questions. We have a bunch of questions in the queue and if you have others, please, um, you know, raise them. If you also want to, you know, speak up and have something to say as we're, as we're going through questions and discussing, feel free. Um, cool. Nico, are you, do you want to run the, the questions or are uh, you in a I, position to do that sure. or would you like me to? <laughs> sure, I can. There was one question that I wanted to start with because I was super curious about it too and now I'm looking for it. But it was the one about using um, human poo in the garden. I don't know where that one was, um, maybe earlier in the chat, but yeah, I thought that that's something that um, in my own experience with compost and, and woofing experiences, I've seen people with different perspectives on. So yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Uh, sounds like Molly, you've got your hand raised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I have two perspectives on that. I think that hue manure is not necessarily bad as an idea, but the amount of pharmaceuticals that we're on as a culture, that there's a lot of stuff that we may not want going into our food coming out of people's bodies based on the pharmaceuticals uh, that they're taking. We have many composting toilets on our farm and we have a specific worm bin for hue manure and we run all our hue manure through verma composting. And then it only goes on non-edible trees. So it goes in, we have a lot of like areas of their farm that are just for the bees or for pollinators or for wild. Um, and we, and we use them, we use that worm castings. I think they're pretty sterile. Like I'll put my nose right in it after it's gone through the worms, but um, it, it's not legal. I don't think for, to put it on food crops. So we just um, put it on the outsides of our property, but um, I don't even think it's really legal to have composting toilets, to be honest, but we do have a specific worm bin that's just for the composting toilets. And uh, we mix it with um, wood chips and our composting toilets use um, cocoa peat. And so it's already like a lot of cocoa peat. And then it, we put wood chips, layer it with wood chips and it goes through the Verma, uh, a special Verma separate from my big um, verma compost where we make the tea for feeding out to the rest of the farm. So that's where we stand. And I don't, th I think that human manure is totally uh, a perfectly acceptable and most organic potting mixes that you would buy in the United States are using uh, processed from our sewer plants. And so it's kind of a weird thing that you're not allowed to on the farm. But um, I do think that the worms are a really great way to sterilize it. I don't know how that would, uh, with the um, pharmaceuticals though. Anyone else on the panel wanna say, share on that or, oh, or shall we move on? Um, I have some experience with humanure and um, because we live on an island and um, we don't wanna soil our our groundwater. So we, so our keeping our water safe is primary. So we've been composting um, human manure for about a decade. And there's a great book called the, the Human Manure Handbook, which is our Bible of how to do it safely. And we, um, we feel really safe doing it. So, you know, we're eating each other's pharmaceuticals, I guess, <laughs> is the thing. And we've, we've been, super safe and it's it's been really successful and it doesn't smell and all the things that people are like ooh gross um you know we have some big like fish totes that we haul 
and you just tip it over. I mean, I'm so used to it, it's not a big deal, but I know it's um, basically taboo in our culture to even talk about this, so <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> but um, I'm really comfortable with it. And I, you know, we actually are a little bit missionary about it because we, you know, in regular life, we, we shit in our drinking water and then we pour chemical, we, you know, it goes down the drain and then we pour a ton of chemicals to clean our drinking water again. And so we think that's a sign of an insane culture, <laughs> but um, we call it black gold. And, you know, I can just, um, so we're not scientists and we're not, we're just trying to grow a garden. And that's my experience as human earth. <laughs> but I'm open. What's I'm, the name of the book again, Mary? It's the Humanure Handbook. Okay. Uh, someone Jenkins, maybe Carl knows if he can unmute. Maybe, I don't know if you remember. Anyway, um, I'm happy to answer questions about it because I love talking about it. Actually, we there's a really great organic farmers and growers um, fair, MAFCA, the main organic farmers and growers um, association, the oldest organic association in this country. They have a really incredible fair in September and we go, our partners that we farm with, um, well, garden, I guess. <laughs> um, they, she often does the humanure demonstration and um, presents that at the fair every year and loves to talk to, and there are a lot of humanure enthusiasts in Maine, apparently, so. Um, Movement's that. going, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. I don't think it's coming to the Thank Kent Denver campus anytime soon, so you don't have to worry. I don't. I think Denver is not. <laughs> anyway, it's great, but I'm happy to share about our experience. All right. So we had a question from Beth um, that says, "I have three acres with little access to water. My goal is not to produce food. I don't have the water for that. I've started several compost piles and use rain and snow when available for the compost." What cover crop uses, oh, sorry, what cover crop uses little water, but will also help pull carbon down? Rutger, this may be one that you want to take a stab at. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I would say, you know, something that would be local to, to our habitat. Um, you know, I think we all can agree, you know, grasses are generally a bad idea. Um, I think, um, you know, it, it just very much depends on what what you're trying to what you're trying to get out of it, and and um, you know, the most important thing would I think would be just making sure you keep your bare soil covered, um, and you know, at, at like out in the the plains area of our of our site, we have areas where they just throw out a bunch of seeds and they see what what catches on. So if you don't have any growing parameters and you're not trying to get a crop out of it, I would go with something that's happy in your in your lawn. Yeah. Any other panelists want to chime in on that? Well, you know, you know, I, I think... go along with I go along with with Rutger that the native crops are always bet, best. But if you look at our tall grass prairie, and you look at um, the really deep soil underneath, that thing only receives regular water. It's not growing necessarily food crop, crops, but it is capturing carbon because what happens? With the crested wheatgrass or Sudan grass or anything else that is native to there is that those tall grasses are mowed down by the winds and that cover is the most important thing. If you think about your skin exposed to the elements, whether it's sun or our bitter cold that we're getting here and it's going to get, get fried or, or um, affected, that's the most important thing is covering the soil, capturing the carbon because of the tall growth, the photosynthesis that occurs, and then those roots are constantly in the soil. So I wouldn't be as concerned as, you know, the specific crop, but make it something that's appropriate for your area and then leave that cover down. So you're not raking it away. And, you know, you can make the correlation with what we do in our landscapes. Um, we have an excessiveness of neatness in our area. So, you know, in the fall, the leaves come down and instead of leaving them, we, we rake them away we remove everything from our gardens at the end of the season. Um, we cut down our perennial dead, dead stalks in the, you know, in the springtime, we haul them away. 
And then what do we do when the leaves are gone? We go ahead and we, we purchase compost to, to put back in, or we purchase mulch from bags to cover the soil, rather than looking at what does mother nature have right around us that we're hauling away, putting in landfills, contributing to climate change, rather than saying the most important thing is that cover, blanket, keeping it covered. I was just, uh, before I had a fiscal challenge going on, so I'm currently not able to get around too well. I won't bore you with the specifics of that. But when I was very mobile, prior to um, a, a deep freeze, I just went out with my hand, uncovered the leaves and straw that are on my growing beds, and dug up a sample for of, of my garden soil with my hands from for my master composter course, which is coming up. And I was able to put my hand down eight inches into that soil versus a foot away, uncovered ground felt like a rock. Mm -hmm. So that will give you an idea of the idea of, and, and that's 10 years of putting back more than I take out of the power of regenerative techniques. And if I can just build on that, this idea, you know, the idea of cover crops, uh, you know, in our short, in, in our land of a short growing season, <clears throat> you know, people think we've got six months to grow things. And then we, you know, and then there's nothing that we can do. Everything's dead. Let's clear it. Let's just wait until the next season comes. And this shift to understand that those winter months are months that you're, that the soil's working, that you plant cover crops uh, and you're rebuilding the soil and you're, you're actually doing work. And so we, we, you know, at Doug, we have a fall plant sale and everyone's like, how do you have a fall plant sale? What does that mean? You know, it's, it's because there's work that you can do over the winter and there's really never a time that this cycle isn't, uh, you know, isn't happening. And so, so the idea of cover crops is just, uh, is just beautiful and something that, again, we're, we're asking everyone to be the spark and spread the word. Uh, I think this is really a concept that, especially in Colorado, needs to be spread and needs to be implemented far and wide. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Molly. I think um, just to follow up on both what Judy and Rudker said, but we had a, to put a bunch of stuff out and see what hap what is doing well, or even what might be growing, observe the weeds that are growing, and then you can build off of that. But I was struggling for years with um, Bermuda grass because people feed horses Bermuda grass, and then we were getting horse manure um, and putting it into our compost. Our compost wasn't killing the Bermuda grass. And I just had Bermuda grass everywhere. And it was like, I was saying it was the bane of my existence. I was trying everything. And I actually have surrendered to the Bermuda grass in almost all of my orchards. And you can't believe the spongy 16 inches in two or three years of spongy black soil. And if you can let the orchard get, the trees get established enough and we used cardboard around them, I mean, it's unbelievable. And we have soil infiltration where the Bermuda grass is that is like opposed to like just a little bit away at my neighbor's house where they spray Roundup, it's like four minutes for two cups of water at my neighbor's in between his trees. And where I have the Bermuda grass growing between my trees, we're doing four cups in 19 seconds. And, and that's, I, my land was exactly the same as his four years ago. And it's only been two years that I've let the Bermuda grass just do its thing. So observe what is wanting to grow there. Even if it might be invasive at this point, it's, it's doing a really amazing job of building carbon. And I was battling with this thing in the idea of like things looking organized and neat and all of that. And now I'm just using this as my partner rather than battling it as my enemy. And I just want to piggyback on, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, as they say in permaculture, the problem is often the solution, right? Um, go ahead, Linda. Oh, just, yes, also in perm, like they, a weed is, what is a weed, right? A weed is an inconvenient uh, something growing because we don't understand why it's there. And I think as Molly was alluding to, you know, the stuff is going to grow where it's supposed to grow to do its job. And so we call, you know, we call some, we call them weeds, but what, you know, often what we define as weeds are plants that are healing the soil and are taking out toxins. And, you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more going on to this, this, some, you know, 
this chaos that we call it. Okay, over to you. Uh, here's another great question that I, I would love to, to bring to the panelists. I actually saw this in a permaculture discussion forum I'm a part of today. Um, but the, the question is, what are your thoughts on biochar, creating it and are using it in the soil? Go ahead, Molly. I think as a starting point, it's okay. It, 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 but I don't, I don't think it's like a forever solution. I don't think like burning something and then transporting it. And if you were producing bamboo, for example, and that was what your farm did and you have all these excess weird pieces of bamboo. Uh, my uncle is a regenerative bamboo farmer in Hawaii. So I'm using this. It makes sense in his operation. In my operation in Southern California, where we don't have trees and stuff all around to make biochar, it doesn't uh, make sense. And I think that sometimes the microbiology can like living in the char so much that it's not uh, going out everywhere else. I think it's a great starter. I think it's a great step or tool, but I think that the end goal should be that we should be able to utilize what's on our farm and what's around us to create uh, this um, circular situation that's not getting things from outside. So I think it would make sense if you're producing hardwoods or you're producing something that would produce something that wants to make biochar, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I can absolutely talk on biochar too, um, that, you know, it's, so they discovered this by going in the, um, the rainforests in South America and they discovered civilizations by the soil. Um, and there's an industry behind this soil, it, it regrows and every eight years they skim the top and they sell it to farmers. Um, it's still kind of controversial in soil science. Some people don't like it. Um, uh, I think um, my impression is um, a lot of people will put charcoal instead of biochar on their crops. Uh, so what that does is it's very good. Uh, it has a very high cation exchange capacity, which means it can take nutrients and give out nutrients. But if you just put the charcoal without charging it with some kind of nutrient, you're going to suck the nutrients out of your plants. Sure. Um, so the experiment I'm trying to do in Chatfield is interesting. We're going to try to damage our weeds with biochar and suck the nutrients out and see if that oh. works. I've never seen that done before. Um, oh. But long story short, it's up in the air. I personally would love to try it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, this question I think is really great. It's kind of hinting to why we're here um, for everyone. What are one or, one or two of your best tips for backyard gardeners to start implementing regenerative practices? Use what you have on your land to give back more. So um, what I do is, you know, nothing that I grow gets hauled away. I do a lot of sheet composting in my garden. So when my garden is finished growing, um, I practice crop rotation by chopping down the crops and making another area and digging them under the soil where that becomes my growing area for next year. I use the leaves from my yard to mulch my crops um, I have a, um, some neighbors that have got goats and I use the straw in my, to, for mulching. So again, using as many products. I also use weeds to make a weed tea, very similar to a compost tea, where I just will um, dig weeds and uh, put them in a barrel, stir, stir them around for a while, ferment it. Sometimes put an aquarium pump in and spray that on my compost pile. So what I do, and I grow a lot of tall native grasses, warm season grasses, um, not just big blue stem, but um, giant Sask Saskatoon, again, grow things that are native. When all that stuff gets pruned, it stays as a mulch right there on the ground. So I'm using material from my own yard to regenerate the soil, to make it in a healthier condition even with 130 pound, 120 pound Great Pyrenees tromping on it all the time. Covering really works with local stuff. So those are a couple of easy tips. And the other thing that I do is make sure um, that I'm checking the water that is required. There are no vegetable crops that are um, 
you know, that are going to be drought tolerant. So I use a little, you know, I have not a large garden. It's certainly not a farm like, like Rutger or Molly has. But I use a stick or my finger to dig it, you know, three to four inches in the soil after it's mulched and make sure that that crop really needs water. So I'm mindful of that and have warm boxes too. Easy things. Oops, what happened? Any of our other panelists have a, a simple tip to get started? I think compost, compost, compost. I think that co like the number one cause of methane in the world is our food yeah. scraps uh, going into the landfill. And this is, I might sound like a broken record, but I mean, anything that we can be composting is making a huge difference. And we are always talking about carbon in the atmosphere and carbon that we're admitting, but we rarely are talking about methane. And so I think that just remembering that every time you scrape some food scraps into the trash, that's not where they wanna be. That's actually the opposite of where they wanna be. And so if everybody could just have a small compost pile, medium-sized compost pile, lots of cities, I don't know about where everybody is, but lots of cities give away compost um, and have compost trainings. And also if you, to integrate animals, chickens are an awesome way. And I lived in a golf course like neighborhood before I lived here and I had chickens there. And I read this thing that if one in three people kept five chickens, we wouldn't have to have any factory farms, that that would be enough chick, that would make enough eggs for everybody that in the whole United States to have the eggs that they eat. Um, so having a few chickens is an awesome way to integrate um, uh, if you don't have coyotes and if you do, you can get Judy's <laughs> great Pyrenees or I have six great Pyrenees. So we get to okay. guard my chickens, but, um, yeah, I think that chickens are an awesome way to integrate animals. They can clean up garden beds. They can clean up areas. If you make a little small coop, you can move them and have them clean areas for you and give back to the soil and compost, compost, compost. Those would be my two, uh, recommendations. One quick thing that I'd like to add to, to Mary for the small grower at home, um, make, make sure that you're not doing a monocrop type of gardening. Um, if you're just growing tomatoes, you're just growing corn, you're just growing whatever it is because you love that, then one of those things gets diseased. And believe me, there are chemical, system, chemical signals that are put out by those plants that will attract that preferred plant pest from miles away. The mustard oils that are given off by the brassica family, which is the broccoli family, will attract that cabbage worm from up to 10 miles away. So if you're growing broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all members of that same family, you're providing a concerted diet for that, for that pest. So vary your plantings, plant pollinators nearby, plants that are gonna attract the beneficial insects, cover your soil, and I agree with compost, 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 give back more than you take out. And also be aware of the amount that you can eat. My goodness, I think most of us plant far too much. Don't realize that one tomato plant can give out 40 pounds of tomatoes. Why do we need to plant 18 tomato plants or 20 tomato plants? Um, unless we're you know, giving to a food bank or feeding the neighborhood or lucky enough to be like Molly, be mindful of what you can eat or share. Don't grow too much or grow to grow more than you can take care of. I have a simple, really simple tip that I can say, which is to sign up for the Doug uh, spring box, where I think you guys produce a little collection of the right things to grow for a beginner uh. garden, starter garden, and also follow their, their website. They have lots of great tips and easy how to classes and things to attend. So I'll do the plug for you. <laughs> yeah, as a as a farmer versus a gardener, it's it's just so different. I mean, we we spend two seconds on a plant, not even. It's just on to the next one. Everything's by hand. Um, and I think as a gardener, you really have the time to to cherish your relationship with one plant, which is special. So I would pick something that's that's easy to start if you're a beginner. Um, and I look everything up on YouTube. I, I would definitely use YouTube. There are gardeners out there who share their experiences. 
Re realize that a plant is like a child, like, you know, Rutger alluded to. You need to care for that. So check the underneath sides of the leaf, spend time with it, let it tell you what it needs before it's eaten to the ground. That's too late. Great wisdom here. Um, I see one last question. And again, if since we have about five minutes left, if you if this conversation has sparked any last things you want to ask about, please do put them in, chat, in the chat. But I see Ginny asked the question that uh, so many people uh, working in urban depleted soils in the Denver metro area ask, anything good about bindweed? Yeah, that slide that, that Rutger showed is a wonderful thing. It's a great craft project for kids. You can weave together, you can do a, a joint project where you're saying, I wonder who can, who can pull or dig out the longest strand of bindweed and you measure it. And then you actually braid it and you make necklaces and belts with it. And then you can incorporate flowers for drying like, like yarrow. It's a wonderful sellable craft project. It's a great project. It also brings kids together with a joint thing. Who can, who can, who can um, get the most bindweed root out, okay? It also shows the power of compost because that picture that showed me with the bindweed on my head at our compost demo site was a bindweed that grew like six feet. You know, the underground runners were going. So it shows you how deeply roots go into compost and rich soil. So bindweed can be an indicator plant for the health of compost pile, how much it goes through. Hmm. Yes, yeah, and, and the same goes for all weeds. Um, you know, look at them as indicators for what's going on in your soil. Our, our big problem at Chatfield is, is bindweed in the front, which has great soil, and uh, thistle in the back, which is an indicator of compacted soil. So you kind of know what you're working with based on the weed, and I just Google the weed and indicator and see what, what comes up. All right. Um, I think somebody posted, love the optimism. <laughs> so, uh, that's pretty great. Um, all right. I think, Nico, are we, any other questions showing up or are we good to wrap up? All right. So guys, I wanted to just thank all the panelists. So I uh, thank Mary and Molly and Judy and Rucker for sharing your wisdom. Um, and Mary, again, yes, thank you for the plug for Doug. Um, we also wanted to let you guys know we have a really neat online community. Uh, Nico, what's the website for that? We have an online community. I'm so it in the chat for you all. <laughs> it's in the chat. But the neat thing about this is it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And any question you have, you can post uh, and, and, you know, Judy will share or one of your neighbors will share. Uh, so there's always, you know, in addition to YouTube, there's just always a really great resource um, that you can take advantage of anytime. And if you learn something or want to, you know, share on the wonders of um, human humor, please do. <laughs> we, wanna, we definitely want to get people uh, thinking and experimenting uh, and exploring more and more. Um, so yeah, so with that, we'll give you guys a co oh, and we have a YouTube channel. So, uh, please check that out, but, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Kent for being, uh, the inspiration to, uh, get this going, um, as well and look forward to ongoing conversations. Um, so with that, everybody enjoy your evening, uh, and we hope you have a beautiful growing season once things chill out. <laughs> all right. Well, Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all so much.